right about time to bring you up to date with what's happening globally and in Nigeria. We we'll begin with French President says French troops to be in New Caledonia for now. Archaeologists find Asian humans in East Timor 44,000 years ago. China begins two days military exercises near Taiwan. Fire rages as Rohingya trapped in Myanmar civil war and state collapses at Mexico rally killing nine, wounding 54. Emmanuel Macron, French president, has said French troops will remain in New Caledonia as long as necessary after over a week of conflict stoked by French plans to change electoral rules in the Pacific Island Territory. On Thursday, Macron arrived in New Caledonia's capital, Noumea, amid continuing demonstrations over voting reforms. The indigenous Kanak people say will water down their vote and undermine their fight for independence. The reforms will permit French people who had lived in New Caledonia for 10 years or more to vote in New Caledonia's provincial elections. Almost 3,000 soldiers have been sent from Paris since the violence erupted and could stay until the Olympic Games in Paris, which started on July 26th, Macron said. Six people, including three young Canucks, have been killed and about 280 people arrested since the pro protest broke out and a state of emergency was declared. Macron observed a minute of silence for the people who had been killed and said if roadblocks and barricades were removed, he would be opposed to extending the state of emergency. The French president also met the pro-independence president of the government of New Caledonia, Louis Mapu, and the president of Congress, Roach Womiton, in a meeting at the residence of France's High Commissioner to New Caledonia in Nomia on Thursday. Macron flew about 17,000 kilometers, 10,500 miles from mainland France to reach Nomia and was anticipated to remain in New Caledonia for around 12 hours. Protesters waving New Caledonian flags lined the streets as the French president's convoy made its way along the newly reopened road from the international airport to Nomia. According to reports, closely 90 barricades put up by protesters had been cleared by heavily armed police and paramilitaries, but new barricades were still appearing the night before Macron arrived. Jimmy Nona from the Kanak and Socialist National Liberation Front of New Caledonia said the pro-independence political party had called for protesters to remove the roadblocks and urged Macron to drop the electoral reform plan. The Kanaks make up around 40% of the slightly over 300,000 people who lived in New California, Caledonia, rather, which lies between Australia and Fiji in the Pacific Ocean. In 1998, France agreed to cede the territory more political power and to limit voting in New Caledonia's provisional and assembly elections to those who were residents of the island at the time under the so-called Nomia Accord. Stone artifacts and animal bones found in a deep cave in northeast Timor offer fresh insight into where ancient humans lived over 35,000 years before Egyptians built the first pyramids. Archaeologists from Australia and United Kingdom universities say thousands of stone artifacts and animal bones found in a cave known as the Lely Rock Shelter in the northern parts of East Timor signify ancient humans lived there some 44,000 years ago. The researchers say their analysis of deep residue dating back between 59,000 and 54,000 years from the cave and other locations in East Timor, also known as Timor Liste, show on an arrival signature that suggests humans were not present in the area before 44,000 years ago. Shimona Kelly, an archaeologist and paleobiologist from the Australian National University, who was involved in the research, said, unlike other sites in the region, the Lely Rock Shelter preserved deep sediments dating between which showed no clear signs of human occupation. The newly examined sediments gave insight into when humans arrived on the island of Timor. Australian National University distinguished professor and archaeologist Sue O'Connor said. The researchers from the Australian National University, ANU, Flinders University, University College London, UCL, and the ARC Centre of Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage published their findings in the journal Nature Communications this week. 
this discovery in the country is the new west in a region known for some of the most ancient archaeologist finds given insight into the lives of asian humans alongside neighboring indonesia and australia now according to report china has begun two days of military exercises in the water and airspace around the self-governing island of taiwan the Eastern Theater Command of the People's Liberation Army commenced the drills at 7.45 a.m. local time on Thursday in the Taiwan Strait, the north, south and east of Taiwan, as well as areas around the islands of Kimmen, Matsu, Wigu and Dongin. Ligji military spokesperson Connell said the joint exercises involving the Army, Navy, Air Force and Rocket Force were a strong punishment for the separatist acts of Taiwan independence forces and a stern warning against interference and provocation by external forces, according to report. The show of power, code named Joint Sword 2024A, comes three days after Taiwan's new president, William Lai ching -te, took his oath of office and called on Beijing to stop its intimidation of the island, which China claimed as its own. Beijing has not ruled out the use of force to achieve its aim of unification and has responded irritably to the inauguration of Lai, a man whom it considers a troublemaker and a separatist. Taiwan's Ministry of Defense said it had placed its military on high alert in reaction to China's exercises, which it described as irrational provocations and actions that disrupt regional peace and stability. Boni Glasser Managing Director of the Indo-Pacific Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States noted that Beijing's response to Lai's election victory in January had been relatively restrained. In Lai's first address to the public after taking his oath, he said, The Republic of China, Taiwan, is a sovereign and independent nation with sovereignty resting in the people and stressed that his government will make no concessions on its democracy and freedoms. He called on Beijing to stop its aggression against Taiwan and strive to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and the entire region. Families of Rohingya people stuck in Myanmar's west are urgently trying to contact loved ones after a weekend of widespread arson attacks displaced up to 200,000 people and triggered widespread damage of homes. The country's Rohingya have long suffered mass atrocities and forced displacement that several, including United Nations experts, consider to be genocide perpetrated by the country's military. Now they are caught between warring forces in a deepening war that has unleashed more violence against the Muslim majority community. The military has been fighting a widening civil war against ethnic armed groups and people's resistance forces across Myanmar since seizing power in a coup. In February 2021, the Arakan Army in the western state of Rakhine, a powerful ethnic minority and group fighting Myanmar's military junta, said it seized a predominantly Rohingya town close to the Bangladesh border. Reports from activists and relatives of residents have the march of AA soldiers torching and looting Rohingya houses in the town of Budhya Duang, stopping people from returning home, confiscating phones and threatening to kill those who try to contact family abroad. A junta imposed internet and telecoms blackout in the state is making it almost impossible for relatives to speak with family members there and for journalists, activists and international monitoring groups to verify exactly what is unfolding. Rohingya rights activists and ex-officials said closely 200,000 people had been forced to flee their homes to escape the fires and that many people, including women and children, had spent several nights hiding out in open paddy fields with no food, medicine or belongings. There are also reports of an unconfirmed number of casualties. The violence echoes attacks on the stateless Rohingya community in 2016 and 2017 when Myanmar's military began a brutal campaign of killing, rape and arson that is presently subject to a genocide probe at the International Courts of Justice, ICJ. A projected one million Rohingya people live now in what many consider to be the world's largest refugee camp in Bangladesh after hundreds of thousands fled the military clearance operations. Moving ahead, in Mexico on Wednesday, nine people were killed and a presidential candidate was briefly taken to hospital after a stage collapse 
under heavy winds at a campaign rally. Candidate George Alvarez Menes said he was not hurt in the incident which happened during his campaign event in the northeastern city of San Pedro Garza, Garcia, Nova Leon. The governor of Mexico State said at least 54 people were wounded and rescue operations were ongoing to save some of the people stuck under the collapse stage. Mexico's Meteorological Service had forecast powerful winds across the region, cautioning of gusts of up to 70 kilometers per hour, 43 miles per hour, beginning Wednesday afternoon. Alvarez Menez later said he was halting all campaign activities after the collapse, but will remain in the state to monitor the situation and victims. He said civil defense teams had checked the structure of the set prior to the event, but that the severity of the wind gusts had caught organizers by surprise. The presidential candidate said a probe into the incident would take place. Governor Garcia urged people in the area to stay indoors, warning of more strong winds, thunderstorms and rain. Mexico heads towards its biggest election in history on June 2nd, which has been marred by surging political violence and assassinations. According to data through April 1st from the research group Data Civica, a figure set to outpace even the bloodiest election cycles in Mexico's past said so far this year, at least 28 candidates have been attacked, with 16 killed. A more story, Sunak calls surprise July election amid poor polls. Rishi Sunak, United Kingdom Prime Minister, announced a snap general poll for July 4th in a statement outside Downing Street on Wednesday evening as his Conservative Party faces a difficult battle to extend its 14 years in power. Sunak said outside Downing Street that he had involved King Charles III of the sporadic summer poll firing the beginning gun on a six-week campaign that is almost universally expected to end in the demise of his conservative government. Sunak was mandated to hold a vote by January 2025 and had long resisted calls to be precise about his plans. But a fall in inflation rates announced early on Wednesday provided the backdrop for his announcement. The step will be welcomed by the Boyant Labour Party, led by Keir Starmer, which is rising in the opinion polls and has sought to present itself as a reform and moderate group that is ready for power. Buckingham Palace, in the wake of the announcement, said the British royal family will postpone engagements, which may appear to divert attention or distract from the election campaign. The King and Queen's D-Day memorial engagements in June are expected to go ahead as scheduled. Sunak sought to paint external factors such as COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine as the context to Britain's economic struggles, saying the two factors combined represented the most challenging time since the Second World War in his speech. Present, present polling is therefore Sunak. Labour starts the campaign around 20 points up on average with the Tories often closer to third-party challenges such as reform and the Liberal Democrats than they are to Labour. When changed to a projection of seats in Parliament, those figures specify either a comfortable Labour win or a potential electoral wipeout for the Conservatives. Sunak will hope that a sharp campaign could result in a remarkable upset for Labour and extend a period of Tory rule which commenced in 2010 and has overseen austerity economics, Brexit, the COVID-19 pandemic, and a cost of living crunch. On judicial matters, Florida Trump documents hearing devolves into shouting in the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case during a marathon day of proceedings, a morning hearing in front of Judge Aileen Cannon devolved into a shouting match amongst the attorneys and the afternoon series of arguments triggered the judge to wonder if the legal tones of the case may be too difficult for judges to understand. The heated arguments played out in a morning proceeding in Fort Pierce, Florida, that had been planned for Walt Nauta, one of ex-President Donald Trump's core defendants, to present arguments that special counsel Jack Smith's team had selectively and vindictively brought charges against him. But the hearing quickly diverted into long-standing disagreement over an August 2022 meeting between Prosecutor Jay Bratt and Nota's defense attorney, Stanley Woodward. Woodward has claimed in a court proceedings and filings that Bratt 
tried to pressure him into convincing Nota to cooperate against Trump by threatening to affect a potential judge judgeship nomination. Cannon did not issue a ruling from the bench on Nota's motion that the case be dismissed on those grounds, nor did Cannon rule on a motion she heard during an afternoon session on Wednesday brought by all three of the case's defendants who claimed that the indictment suffered technical faults that needed the dismissal of the charges. Cannon seemed cynical of those arguments while also expressing worry about jury's ability to understand legal nonsense in the case at a future trial. Nota claims that he was criminally charged in the case as reprisal for refusing to cooperate with the Justice Department's probe into the former president's retention of classified documents at his estate. Wednesday, heated proceedings come as the Manhattan hush money case against Trump nears its conclusion and a new phase of pretrial activity gets underway in the federal classified documents prosecution in Florida. The hearing was the first before Cannon since she indefinitely delayed the start of the trial, which had been scheduled to begin as early as this week. It has been months than a month since the judge has held a public in-person hearing in the case, though she has held at least one sealed proceeding since then. On weather and climate, El Nino worsens climate crisis impacts millions globally. The El Nino climate a phenomenon is increasing the global climate crunch, leading to more frequent and extreme droughts, floods and tropical cyclones. The present El Nino event is among the five strongest on record, triggering substantial weather pattern disruptions worldwide. Severe drought conditions have left millions hungry in southern Africa, affecting a region where 70% of the population depend on agriculture. Meanwhile, in Kenya, Somalia, Burundi and Tanzania, heavy rains and flash floods have affected closely 850,000 people, destroying crops, killing livestock and displacing communities. Afghanistan has faced massive floods due to strangely high rainfall following a dry winter. The floods beginning in March were exacerbated by warm temperatures melting snow packed into rivers, devastating villages. Over 80 people have been affected with 180 fatalities. The World Food Program, WFP, responded rapidly, provided fortified biscuits, nutritional supplements and later food rations and cash assistance. In Southern Africa, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe have declared national emergencies due to drought with nearly 5 million people needing assistance. El Nino, coupled with the broader climate crisis, is adding the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, worsening vulnerabilities from conflict, food price surges and other shocks. Although El Nino is anticipated to transition to neutral conditions by mid-2024, its effects will persist potentially, followed by La Nina, the cooling phase of the climate cycle. Effective defenses against El Nino and climate-connected disasters require integrated elasticity programs, joining early caution systems, financial safety nets, and ecosystem-based solutions like soil regeneration and reforestation. These processes help communities prepare for and lessen the effects of climate shocks rather than depending exclusively on emergency responses. I'll take a short break now. When I come back, I'll bring you stories from Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. You're welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Stories from Nigeria now. Federal government raises minimum wage over 50, offer rather to 57,000 Naira. The federal government has augmented its offer of 54,000 Naira to 57,000 Naira in the ongoing new national minimum wage deliberation with organized labor and organized private sector, OPS. On Tuesday, the government's negotiation had offered to pay a minimum wage of 54,000 Naira. According to reports, the government team added 3,000 Naira to its earlier offer to match the OPS offer after members of the team returned from a short break to consult. Remember that the OPS had earlier upped its offer to 57,000 Naira 
from the initial 54,000 naira it presented during last week's meeting. Organized labor demanded for 615,000 naira, emphasizing that it's based on the present economic reality, but the federal government rejected it. This has led to the meetings to end in deadlock as both parties failed to compromise. On Wednesday, however, in a bid to shift ground so as to ensure speedy conclusion of negotiation on new national minimum wage, the organized labor at the ongoing trap tight committee on the national minimum wage meeting has reduced its demand from 615,000 naira to 500,000 naira. But the private sector has made additional 3,000 naira, taking up its offer to 57,000 naira from the initial 54,000 naira. On labor shifting of ground by the organized labor, the source said labor has been requested to shift a response to the government. They complied and came down to 500,000 naira. On economic matters, federal government apologizes for economic hardships in the country. The federal government has apologized to Nigerians for the pain and economic woes being experienced in the country, noting, however, that the strategies of the President Bola Ahmed Tinibu led government are on trajectory in spite of the currency crunch and inflation, which have frustrated economic growth. Atiku Bagudu, Minister of Budget and Economic Planning on Wednesday, said at the ministerial sectoral update held in Abuja as part of activities marking the May 29, 2024, one-year anniversary of President Tinibu in office. The government has also announced that a one-year anniversary celebration of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu will be low-key, hence emphasis will be placed on only on sectoral briefings. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, also speaking at the event, said President Tinibu has in the last year articulated strategies and programs to lay the foundation for sustainable economic progress and prosperity for all Nigerians. Bagudu said that on that slogan, Renewed Hope Agenda, the Tinibu government chose eight priority areas that will support economic growth and prosperity for Africa's biggest economy. Since the administration took over the office in May 2023, however, the currency has depreciated from around 460 naira per dollar to 1480 naira while inflation has hit 33.69 percent as of april 2024 in april 2023 inflation was measured by the national bureau of statistics nb nbs as 22.22 percent however the minister admitted in his address that both foreign exchange prices and inflation were still above target SGF Senator George Akume said Tinibu is committed to do good governance and the rule of law, adding this has aided to boost democratic institutions and enhance transparency and accountability in governance. A recap of major stories says Macron, French troops to be in New Caledonia for now. Archaeologists find Asian humans in East Timor 44,000 years ago. China begins two days military exercises near Taiwan. Fire rages as Rohingya trapped in Myanmar civil war and stage collapses at Mexico rally killing nine and wounding 44. And that's all on the news. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.